Hello, welcome to Talk Gnosis, a show about Gnosticism and things that are interesting to Gnostics. And uh, that's a little in joke. If there's anybody out there who's uh, aware of the other podcast I'm referencing, uh, drop it in our comments. Um, but yeah, so I'm Jason Memel. I'm part of the uh, Talk Gnosis crew here. I'm one of the co-hosts. My uh, other co-host, Jonathan, can't make it today. Um, but we have with us today, Donald Robertson, who is a uh, prominent scholar and uh, um, uh, I don't know, professor of all things uh, stoic out there, uh, um, uh, speaks about it with a lot of grace and um, and sensitivity out there. And um, yeah, I'm honored to have him on the show. Um, he said some things recently in a, in a blog post that caught my eye that made him think he'd be a good guest today. And so maybe with that, I'll, uh, I'll jump right in. Uh, Donald, um, before before I really kind of like start asking all of my main questions, do you want to kind of give uh, give our uh, listeners a sense of like why I probably asked you be, to be on the show? You asked me to be on the show because I used to be into Gnosticism a long time ago. <laughs> and I still are. I should say I'm still into Gnosticism. But the only difference is I don't have as much time to, to study it anymore because I'm kind of busy doing all my stuff. But a long time ago, and now you're really making, you've trapped me in a corner now where you're making me feel really old. <laughs> but I think we're maybe going back like three decades or something. Um, I got into Gnosticism and I, I was pretty immersed in it as alongside being into a load of other world religions and stuff. And then I got into philosophy and uh, and then that ultimately led me to Stoicism and I was stuck with Stoicism for the past 20 odd years. Do you want me to say a little bit about how I specifically how I initially got into the Gnostic stuff? Do you want me to dive into that? Yeah, the, the if, details, if you can. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> the deeds. Okay, so my father, I, I come from Scotland, and the town in Scotland where I was born, uh, there's a strong Freemasonic tradition. Like, mo uh, maybe all of my friends or most of my friends' fathers were Freemasons. My father was a Freemason. Um, my father passed away when I was about 14, and he didn't leave much behind except a rack of smoking pipes, his wallet, <laughs> and a bunch of books on Freemasonry. And I started reading them, and I thought, what is this stuff like? And I saw Pythagoras and Plato and the cardinal virtues being named among a mixture of Old Testament theology and kind of mystical Christianity and bits of Hellenistic philosophy for one of a better way of describing it. it was a kind of syncretism of these influences and somehow that made me curious and I started reading a lot of stuff about the occult and the Kabbalah and so I think I really I really loved Alistair Crowley as a kid I just loved reading it not as an individual right but I like <laughs> I like reading I like of course well yeah, I like reading his books I thought he was a, a really interesting writer and Israel Regardi, Dion Fortune like all these kind of guys I read new agey books and stuff and I was kind of into martial arts, so I got into kind of books on karate and meditation that were related to it. So then I, I decided, partly because of a, Crowley is one of these guys who's like, you must read all these books, and he'd give you a big list of books. So I went off and I read the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the Upanishads, um, like the Tao Te Ching, the Yi Jing, I read Sun Tzu, I read, you know, a bunch of different uh, religious texts. I started looking at the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Apocrypha, and then lo and behold, once you go down that slippery slope, Jason, you know where you end up is <laughs> in the in the throes of Gnosticism eventually, <laughs> and uh, well, especially once you get into like Kabbalah and stuff like that. And I guess that's what I get into. And then I really loved. I got. I should say, when I was a kid, this is back when everything was made of wood, if you can remember that, and. You know, mm. there was no internet and everything cost two pence. Like, <laughs> and we, you know, we'd have to walk to school barefoot and through the snow and all that kind of stuff. Like, but we didn't, what we didn't have is the internet, right? And we didn't have a huge library, a small Carnegie library in my town. So books were a rare commodity for me growing up. And somehow I managed to, I, get, I think I got Elaine Pagel's The Gnostic Gospels. And I read that. And then I read a few other books about Gnosticism and then I, I somehow managed to order a copy of the Naj Hammadi Library. And that to me was like, you know, this, it was a magical thing, right? It was like when I got my first Black Sabbath album. 
<laughs> you know, just sat tentatively sat around and put it on. So we, I poured over this book and I thought, this is crazy. You know, I was like 16 or something. I don't know. Like it was a kid when I was reading this and thinking, this book's wild. And this is like a secret, you know, uh, thing. And, and there were bits of it that were a bit dry. And then there were bits of it that were wild. Like Thunder, the Perfect Mind is like an amazing, mm. we used that in a Prada advert because it's a massively underestimated, like really cool text. The Gospel of Thomas was really cool. And then there were other ones in there that were my favourites that I, you know, I've, I've kind of forgotten about since. But I poured over the Nag Hammadi or Nag Hammadi uh, or Chernobskian library, whatever you want to call it. And then I think I read some other, uh, like Peace to Sophia and some other kind of Gnostic texts, Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, I read Hans Jonas's book um, on Gnosticism. I got into Rudolf Otto's The Idea of the Holy, but some books on theology mm. um, and I was reading the Upanishads and things like that at the same time so it was very interesting the kind of mystical side of it and I think I got into philosophy then because there was a kind of neoplatonic influence in the, the Nash Hamadi uh, corpus and, and hermeticism I read the corpus hermeticum some of it uh, as well the Pymandries of Hermes Trismegistus and things mm. like that and uh, so I kind of got into that stuff and then I was digging into the Neoplatonism. And here's, a, a, by the way, as an aside, one of the things that kind of blows my mind and I like to point <laughs> out to people is the Nash Hammadi, one of the codices has an excerpt, as you may know, from Plato's Republic. Um, mm -hmm. so there's Socrates talking. So when I'm talking philosophy to people, I like to say, did you know that there's an early Christian Bible that has Socrates in it? <laughs> and they're like, what? Like in a parallel universe, like, you know, the sect of Christians may have become, you know, we might have ended up with a Bible that has Socrates in it. Like there was like a, there's a Gnostic uh, codex that, that has Socrates in it. How wild is that? Um, and then so you have mm. these other bits of influence that are a bit more like questionable or indirect or subtle. Um, and alongside this explicit chunk of the Plato's Republic. And so I read then Hans Jonas's, not Hans Jonas, uh, Pierre Hadot's uh, The Simplicity of Vision, his book on Plotinus. And I started kind of reading books on Neoplatonism. And then I went, probably went to university around about that time. And mm. I did my degree in philosophy. So I studied Wittgenstein, Heidegger in particular, which are unusual to study at undergraduate level but they were into them at Aberdeen. And then I uh, also studied Plato and Aristotle. So I studied some Greek philosophy, but not the Stoics and not Neoplatonism at university. <laughs> and then after I graduated, I began training as a psychotherapist. And I thought it would be a great idea to combine philosophy and psychotherapy. So I thought the obvious way to do that, the only show in town in that regard, seemed to be to combine existentialism with psychoanalysis. And I was quite mm. into Freud and Jung and stuff like that. I should say I also read Jung's stuff on Gnosticism, like I've forgotten what it's called now. Um, Jung had this kind of visionary Gnostic text yeah. as well. I forgot the name the, of it. Is it the Red Book? Or uh, like I know he's written other Maybe other books on Gnosticism, but like the Red Book was kind of his like personal it's Gnostic. Under another title that's called the oh. it's called the Gnostic Jung or something, the edition that I. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Book, like that's in that. Anyway. A long time since mm -hmm. I read it. But um, so I got into all that kind of stuff. And I, I went to do a master's degree at Sheffield University in an interdisciplinary center where we combined sociology, philosophy, psychiatry, psychotherapy and stuff. And I, I did my master's degree in psychoanalytic studies, or really it was in philosophy and, and psychotherapy. And my dissertation was on Jean-Paul Sartre and uh, existential psychoanalysis. And around about that time, I did something happened that happens to a lot of people. I suddenly decided I was doing completely the wrong thing. And that's usually <laughs> like a kind of, uh, this is almost a metaphor for kind of like Gnosticism, right? <laughs> like, I had this kind of conversion. I thought, this is all wrong. Like, and I, I thought, there's no way that I can really, combining Heidegger with Freud seems like a dead end, you know? Um, people have been trying to do it for like, you know, over half a century, and it's not really worked out that well in practice. And cognitive therapy um, seemed to me to work much better with my clients mm. and, and became the leading evidence-based approach to psychotherapy. 
And I saw that cognitive therapy was based on stoicism. So I started reading the Stoics. And I went from, I knew that I wanted to combine um, like meditation and psychology and psychotherapy and philosophy somehow. And I thought existentialism and Buddhism and psychoanalysis were the way to do it. And then I suddenly realized stoicism was a, for me, a much better fit. Mm. And I got into stoicism and remained into stoicism to, um, for the next 25 years or something, which brings us, that's why I'm s s talking to you right now. And then I, <laughs> so I haven't read um, some of those books that we've been talking about for quite a while, but I still, I wish I had time to go back and, and read them again. And they, I guess they influenced me early on and they set me on this path. And I still probably, maybe the way that I read the Stoics uh, in some ways is kind of shaped a bit by my early exposure to Hermeticism Neoplatonism and Gnosticism. You know, there's a uh, there, there, there's a sense that has for me of like, yeah. The one thing I found in your uh, in your writing and um, and in the courses and stuff that I've uh, I've seen you do and take I've taken part in the um, uh, what's the what's the term of the course? Uh, S S M S M R T S M R T. <laughs> Somebody told me in a Slavic language that means that's the word for death. Oh no! Like, which I thought was kind of cool. Like you know, it's, that was kind of interesting. It was sort of appropriate. But we have that well, yeah. stoic mindfulness and resilience training, and we there we go. E learning course that we run based on stoicism and CBT. Um, yeah, and so uh, when I've taken part in that, like what I've found really fascinating is that uh, there's a non dogmatic approach to the way you talk about the Stoics. Like you, you use the the um, the most famous Stoic texts, but uh, you're not. You're often not saying because say for example epictetus said this you have to do this yeah. um and i wonder if it's because of that kind of open reading that gnosticism and neoplatonism sort of suggests is like we can't we, uh, the, the our language can't wrap around the full experience so we're going to do our best to imply a direction versus give you a yeah. you know well gosh there's like three answers to that um <laughs> i think one it just comes from teaching a mixed audience, right? Mm. So we know if we're doing SMRT, it's online. I estimate, I'll go, how many people? We have this online course called Stoic Week as well, which is a similar mm. quarter version. And remember, we estimated about 20,000 people had done that. Um, SMRT, I'm not sure. Maybe it's like, like under 5,000, but it's still a lot of people. And I've run other big courses online. So it partly comes from um, when you're dealing with a very large, very diverse group of people, and, and they come from all over the world, right? Probably just under half of them are from the US. Mm. You know, so people from like, I don't know, Egypt, Greece, you know, China, like, you know, wherever, like all over the, the world, even Scotland, even Canada. Like, <laughs> we have like in these obscure corners of the world, like, there's people getting into stoicism. Um, so I think you have to adopt, and also therapists, and maybe what's influencing me in a way as well is in clinical practice, you cannot indoctrinate clients into your religious or moral values, right? Mm, mm -hmm. It's not, that's a not appropriate <laughs> thing for therapists to do. And, and you know, I, I used to train therapists. So one of the, and supervise them. So one of the things I'm kind of interested in is the stuff that clients complained about, right? And mm. uh, one of the things that clients complain about is the therapists trying to indoctrinate them into their religious views and stuff. So mm. we, we learn to adopt a neutral attitude and to be careful to kind of avoid insofar as it's, but it's never completely possible to suspend your values, but insofar as it's reasonable and, and practical to do it, we try to um, be value free in a sense, and certainly not to explicitly indoctrinate clients, indoctrinate clients into particular views. So in the course, which is inspired by CBT, we adopt a similar approach. And then I guess also at a personal level, and we talked about this before we, we came on, um, I guess growing up as a kid, like a lot of people who grew up in a, a Christian environment, it kind of almost turned me off to religion. And, you know, my idea of Christianity was somebody just kind of telling me, you know, to believe in a lot of stuff that didn't make sense. Um it's like a, there's an old joke about a school teacher that asks a bunch of kids how to define faith. And this kid says faith is the ability to believe in something, even though you know it's not true. 
Like, <laughs> that, that was what Christianity kind of seemed to me, you know, and it was like you'd get a clip around the year if you didn't believe in it. So it wasn't an edifying exposure to religion early on. And that's partly, I guess, rather than turning against religion, I thought, well, I'm going to explore alternative approaches to religion. Um, and I had friends who were devout Christians and I'd sit and have kind of friendly debates with them about Gnosticism and Christianity and stuff like that. So that kind of, I thought, well, you know, we I want to avoid this kind of doctrinaire, sort of rigidly dogmatic uh, way of talking about subjects. And then the third thing, which we also touched on earlier, you and I in our discussion, is that, now forgive me for putting this very crudely I like let me let me put this as a slogan if you like or a maxim, <laughs> and then I'll elaborate on it to avoid being misinterpreted I am I would say emphatically that in my mind stoicism is a philosophy and not a religion but by religion here I specifically mean a religion like evangelical Christianity where there's a kind of dogmatic primacy of faith over reason or tradition mm. you know something like that so for sure, the Stoics talk about religion and talk about spiritual ideas, but I believe that they get there on the basis of Socratic method and reason and not like just kind of gritting their teeth and making a leap of faith or believing in something because their ancestors or their parents believed in it. You know, so to me, there's quite a big difference between adopting spiritual or religious values in this kind of rigid doctrinaire way, um, mm -hmm. you know, just making us believe something and arriving at them as the conclusion of a philosophical process of reasoning. And so and I, I think that's part of what Stoicism is all about. So, yeah, we, we wanted to encourage people to think Socratically, like mm -hmm. philosophically and reflectively. And maybe it also comes from having spent four years at Aberdeen doing philosophy as well um to think for themselves and our position is you know i think the stoics would have said if you apply the socratic method you they would be optimistic that you would end up arriving at similar conclusions to them mm -hmm. um, that's probably why they think that they think it seems to me that stoicism is a kind of perennial philosophy and that's why Seneca quotes Epicurus and why the stoics quote the greek tragedians and the pythagoreans and stuff because they mm -hmm. think other people are bound to arrive at similar conclusions because this isn't some scriptural tradition we're talking about that you know like we're not the chosen ones or something like this is these conclusions are derived from reasoning and we the stoics would have expected if they could have gone to china they wouldn't have been surprised to find chinese philosophers arriving at some of the same conclusions that they arrived at, like, because they think we all have the capacity to reason, and if we apply it consistently to the right sort of questions, we'll probably arrive at, at similar conclusions. Mm. You know, so it's thought there were right answers, but you know, we need to arrive at them um, by thinking for ourselves and not because they're kind of handed down to us in a, a, a scripture or something like that. The, there's a problem, I think, for tre treating um, Stoicism as a kind of scriptural tradition, which is that. And maybe it's also, I, I would say my interpretation of the Stoics puts them much more in their historical context in relation to Socrates, who I think is mm -hmm. the important precursor. So I see the Stoics as very much a Socratic sect, as they're sometimes as it's sometimes put, and using the Socratic method. And so one of the many things that we're told by Plato that Socrates was quite emphatic about was that, um, I don't think he says this specifically in relation to religious texts but or religious pronouncements but he's when he's talking about the poets um socrates for example in the protagoras says it's kind of a silly game in a way to stand around interpreting and uh, doing exegesis on uh homer or hesiod um because the poets aren't here to answer our questions about what they meant and so you can make these texts mean anything you want, as people would put it today. He's basically, that's his point, versus mm. Protagoras, who thinks that interpreting um, poetry is, is one of the, he says, is one of the main sources of wisdom. Socrates thinks it's interesting, but it's more important that we learn to think for ourselves, because you can kind of make the texts 
mean different things. Like William Blake said, we both read the Bible day and night, but you read black where I read white. Um, <laughs> I, I yeah. think that's kind of how Socrates felt about this, right? And uh, I believe that the Stoics had read that and were influenced by it. And they have <laughs> allegorical interpretations for sure. They were famous for it of uh, creation myths and uh, like, you know, found in other myths found in, in Greek poetry. Um, but I don't believe that that's the dominant source of wisdom. I, I think that the Stoics think, f first and for foremost, reason like, has to be applied to ethical questions. And then if these allegorical interpretations confirm that, that's kind of interesting. Um, but that shouldn't be our primary source of uh, mm -hmm. It's not reliable enough. That's, I think, uh, yeah, that sense of like... Um uh the, the sort of the usefulness of the interpretation is as much as it kind of can align with your own reason versus uh being being swayed because a text says something that you didn't necessarily believe um uh maybe one thing i should uh it occurred to me i should have put it in our question sheet and i don't know if this is an easy thing to do quickly but um I, I can imagine that some of our audience might be uh, very interested and knowledgeable about a lot of very uh, various Gnostic ideas, but they might not know the basics of Stoicism, particularly like I think uh, the 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 really popular elements of Stoicism that have come up lately through yourself and Massimo's uh, uh, talks that are now online. Um, do you think you could give like that kind of the QED of Stoicism, just that like it's essentially like the that core yeah. kind of framework? Yeah. So let me say two things then, right? When people ask me that question, I say I should probably explain a little bit about the history of Stoicism briefly. Mm -hmm. And then what the Stoics believed. So Stoicism is a Greek philosophy, kind of. Like, although it was founded actually by a Phoenician immigrant who, according to one version, was shipwrecked or ended up at the court of Piraeus beside Athens, um, studied Greek philosophy under different schools at the academy, at the Lyceum, or not actually not the Lyceum, at the academy, and in the Megarian school, I studied under the cynics. So Zeno of Citium, or Citium, is his name from Cyprus. Um, and he founded the Stoic school around about 301 BCE and became one of the main uh, Greek schools of philosophy uh, during the Hellenistic era. It flourished for centuries, had many uh, important leaders, including Chrysippus, who was one of the most prolific intellectuals and authors in the ancient world. He was a heavyweight thinker. Um, and then the interesting thing historically is that the Romans, when they were increasingly exposed to Greek philosophy, took a real shine to Stoicism. And it really resonated with the martial values of the Roman Republic. And so Prominent Roman statesmen became Stoics. Cicero was not a Stoic, but was very drawn to Stoicism and studied it and wrote about it extensively. So he's one of our main sources. Um, Cato, uh, the younger, his contemporary, who left no writings behind, was an, an important Stoic. And Brutus, one of the assassins of Julius Caesar, arguably, according to some sources, was influenced by Stoicism. Mm. Um, and then Augustus. The, a generation later, the founder of the Roman Empire had sto two Stoic tutors and apparently wrote about Stoicism towards the end of his life and maybe set a precedent for Roman emperors to be trained in Stoicism. Um, so then we have Seneca, the younger, who John Malkovich is portraying in the movie that's just come out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's going to become pretty well known soon. And so Seneca was the tutor um to the emperor nero i'm going to say this just even though i know it really annoys people he was basically <laughs> a sophist like who but he he was a professional rhetoric tutor and speech writer to the emperor nero and wrote many books about stoicism many of which survive today so he's one of our most important sources for stoic philosophy and then epictetus whose life kind of overlaps with seneca's he was a slave of one of nero's uh, with, of Nero's Greek secretary. Um, Epictetus, arguably the most important teacher of philosophy in Roman history. Um, crippled slave, we have his discourses and the uh, handbook are in Caridian. And then Marcus Aurelius, whose life overlaps with Epictetus, although he never met him. Marcus Aurelius's tutors probably met Epictetus. Marcus Aurelius was surrounded by Stoic tutors 
and he's our kind of quasi philosopher king. Like he was trained thoroughly in Stoicism for many many decades. Um, he had a copy of the Discourses of Epictetus that he studied religiously, if you like. <laughs> and we have the meditations or his private notes that survive today. And then Stoicism weirdly almost completely vanishes from the historical record, which is odd because it looks like it became really trendy under Marcus Aurelius, as you would expect. But then, you know, it, we hear virtually nothing about it after that. So the argument is it's superseded or assimilated into Neoplatonism, and then Neoplatonism is kind of oppressed by, uh, eventually by, by early Christian um, uh, leaders um, who, who turn against pagan thought. Um, but Stoicism kind of carries all the way down. It has some influence throughout Western history. And then there's a, a resurgence of interest in the Renaissance in, in Stoicism. Um, and we have this thing called Neo-Stoicism that tries to combine Stoicism with Christianity. And then uh, it became popular again because it's the main philosophy that influenced modern cognitive behavioral therapy. That's a potted history of Stoicism. And then mm -hmm. what did the Stoics believe? I would say the Stoics were first and foremost a Socratic sect. They were influenced also by heavily by the some of the natural philosophers and by Pythagoreanism. So they mm -hmm. kind of eclectic in a way. They were heavily influenced by cynicism. Almost the, the seen as a kind of the cynics and the Stoics are seen as kind of like cousins in ancient philosophy. And uh, they believed that virtue or arity is the only true good. That's the Cicero says that's their main central doctrine, which interestingly is a, a, a ethical doctrine, not a theological mm -hmm. doctrine. I know that's mm -hmm. going to have people tearing their hair out, going, you can't separate theology and ethics. And I'm like, but it is, it's an ethical doctrine, right? So, <laughs> like, and then they have theological doctrines that go with that. They were famous for their writing on dialectic or logic. Um, and our main sources, we have like a book's worth of fragments and testimonia relating to the early Stoics. We probably less than 1% of Stoic literature survives today. We mainly have these late Roman imperial Stoics, Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, and then like a handful of other things. Um, and the, so the central doctrine is that virtue is the only true good. And from that, it follows the, the things that appear good to most people, like Sony Playstations, and <laughs> you know whatever cinnamon lattes and you know <laughs> uh, trophy wives and you know being the president of america and you know what the stories <laughs> call external goods right health wealth and reputation all those kind of things that everybody goes crazy about um those are things that appear good to people and the stoics believed that that's misleading and that they're not as good as they appear to be and in fact, virtue or wisdom is the only true good. And um, it allows us to use these things well, or it's abstinence it leads us to use these things badly. And so therefore, that has a massively obvious psychological consequence. It's an ethical doctrine with an obvious psychological correlate, which is if someone really believed that virtue is the only true good that comes from their own character and their own volition, then losing health, losing wealth, losing reputation wouldn't be the end of the world to them. They would have a kind of emotional resilience that comes from their ethical worldview. Mm. Um, and that's partly why stoicism has ended up influencing modern psychotherapy and, and what we call resilience training today. So the other famous doctrine that you get in Epictetus that's closely related to that is the dichotomy of control, which says that we normally get confused about what is directly under our control and what isn't. And so clarifying that distinction is important to our autonomy and to our self-improvement. And then following on from that, the idea that our passions are caused by our beliefs. So Stoics took from Socrates this intellectual theory of the passions or the cognitive theory of the emotions, as we call it today. Epictetus says it's not things that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. Now, that has seismic implications for psychotherapy, more than it might appear at first. Mm. Um, it opens up like a whole toolbox of cognitive therapy techniques, which we now know work, because there are <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of studies that demonstrate that they're effective. 
Um, so the Stoics were way ahead of their time. And I'll add to that, just while I'm on my hobby horse, I guess, that I love reading Freud and Jung and those guys, but I am I put it out there that Freud held back progress in psychotherapy by about half a century in, in many regards. Mm. And um, Freud was essentially a pseudoscientist. Like, although he goes on about loving science, he, what he does is quite antagonistic to scientific method. And the Stoics had psychological insights that are central to cognitive therapy that Freud and Jung had no concept of. So mm. it's weird to read the Stoics now and then read these early like uh, 20th century psychotherapists and think, how did those guys end up so f- like pre-Stoic in their thinking? Like the Stoics are way ahead of them. It's kind of, <laughs> it's eerie. Like you know, the main insight in modern psychotherapy is the cognitive theory of emotions, and the Stoics explicitly had that, and Freud and Jung had no concept of it. That's why it was in advance when cognitive therapy introduced it. So that's a, that, it, that's uh, a weird thing to see. It uh, it makes me think also of some uh, prominent 21st century uh, psychotherapists who. Are also seem to be missing a Socratic method and, a, and an awareness of, of uh, Stoicism. <laughs> um, just I'm not going to go too far down that road because yeah. that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> yeah, I well, let me put it this way: that modern self help gurus, I think, are a real mixed bag. They remind me of the sophists, like they have mm. really combine really good advice with really bad psychological advice, and in particular, I think the problem of anger is woefully um, mm. badly addressed and actually inflamed and made worse by some of these guys um and completely i think it has got to do with the fact that they completely ignore cognitive therapy and the socratic tradition and their thinking um so thanks for giving us that kind of that that synopsis of uh, of stoicism and like I, I should say to our audience part of the reason i wanted to have donald on the show even if donald hadn't written about loving uh, Gnosticism in his youth, <laughs> I I'd, I'd still would want him here because um, uh, I feel like uh, my own engagement with Stoicism has led me into being even a, like a better Gnostic, a better uh, um, going, experiencing my Gnosticism through a Socratic process, um, I would say, uh, which is to say that not not uh, solely looking for a new answer to to any given question that I then can follow, but like remaining open to the question entirely and continuously. Um, uh, so maybe um, there's a few different roads I can go down here. Uh, but one thing I'm thinking about here, like the the problem of control, or sorry, the dichotomy of control, um, is that uh, like, I think for a lot of people encountering Gnosticism now, they get engaged with it because it helps them square a, a problem in Christianity of the problem of evil. Um, uh, in that sense of like, why do bad things happen to good people? Um, now, Gnosticism, depending on how rigid people define it, can either be bad things happen to good people because there's someone bad in charge, <laughs> you know, and there's someone good beyond that, but we're we're trapped under this this bad control. Um, I think that's a a second order explanation of the of the problem. Like it's a you know, you have this sense of benevolence and calm, and then you start to wonder why you don't get to feel that all the time. And then you start to go, well, there must be a reason. There must be, you know, I must be in prison. Um, but where I'm kind of going with here is that, like, uh, is, it, like, uh, do you do you agree with that kind of, uh, the that idea that maybe stoicism is also kind of helping answer that question, but maybe from the other direction, kind of as you're saying about, like, uh, trying to determine internally what good and evil is? I think if I remember rightly, this is a problem of theodicy. I'm not a theologian, but mm-hmm. yeah. it works weirdly, Marcus, well, it's not that weird, but Marcus Aurelius <laughs> doesn't have many philosophical, doesn't have that many philosophical arguments in the meditations. He tends to just have these like aphorisms and maxims and stuff, but he does have a couple of little arguments and, and one of them directly relates to this question. And so what he says is that rather than thinking good and bad things happen to good and bad people alike, um, and so therefore the gods can't be just, Marcus says, we must be wrong about whether these things are intrinsically good or bad. Like, So if a bad person wins the lottery, for instance, 
like or they're blessed with really good health you know marcus takes that as evidence that good health and winning the lottery aren't intrinsically good like and what makes them good is the use that we make of them and the even more radical idea that the stoics have is that the the contrary of these things or the opposite of them isn't intrinsically bad and it could be that poverty and ill health are actually things that a wise individual flourishes in the face of by learning to use them well in the sense that their character might potentially be strengthened. Now, I know that seems like a radical idea to people, but you know, the weird thing is, it's been said a number of times that Stoic philosophy in some ways resembles the kind of wisdom that you get uh, as you get as you get older and you you're able to reflect you know it's kind of like there are two pe- there are two types of people in this world um, there is the type of person that reaches the age of 40 and doesn't change because they've never stopped to reflect on their experience and then there's the kind of person that hits 40 or whatever you know somewhere along the lines stops to look back in their life and review how it went and i i it seems like a trivial thing like i think all good advice psychologically seems simplistic you know that's why people aren't receptive to it often you know like as you get older you start to think all the cliched advice is actually right like and it just went over your head when you were younger like a good advice is often the wood to the trees but as you get older and you look back in your life one of the things that you'd potentially realize is that things that seemed catastrophic to you when you were younger ended up being for the best like i mean especially people will look back and if you think on your first boyfriend or girlfriend and when you broke up with them um assuming that you did then you know it probably seemed like a terrible breakup and you know it was a bad thing at the time but you know 20 30 40 years later like it doesn't seem like a catastrophe anymore because you probably went on and met loads of other people like and had many relationships and equally, there's maybe been jobs that didn't work out for you, and that seemed terrible at the time. But then mm-hmm. you look back on it and think, well, I'm, you know, I'm kind of glad that I moved on from that, like it worked out for the best because I, I found something else. So I think the ability to look back in our life with a bit of distance contributes to a similar perspective to the one that the, the Stoics are talking about. And they're questioning of whether things that appear bad are actually intrinsically bad. Or whether what matters is the way that we use them and whether you know things that people think of as catastrophes in life may actually be opportunities um for personal growth in some cases and like the worst type of person in the epic tita says what would have come of hercules the, their big hero um if he just lain in bed and done nothing and uh, <laughs> he, said, he wouldn't even deserve the name hercules is how he puts it <laughs> So Hercules had all these terrible things happen to them. But the idea, according to the legend, is that he flourishes and becomes like a superhero because he's faced all these um, challenges and, and all this adversity and, and with courage and dignity and uh, endurance. Hmm. There's something too, like, uh, again, just sort of speaking for myself as a as a both Gnostic and Stoic practitioner, my what I've found about the like and maybe to kind of go go with what you were saying there is that a lot of what I think the stoic practice does is it allows you to try to see the problem you're experiencing now-ish as though you're experiencing it 40 years from now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to create that distance without needing to wait that length, you know. Um, but uh uh part of what I've found is that it's then allowed me to create a space of calm and benevolence and um and uh, uh, essentially to create a space, like almost a meditative space in which uh, pursuits of gnosis become then easier, you know, like mm-hmm. pursuits of meditative states and, and, uh, and conceptual spaces that, that are, are what the, the, the gnosis of Gnosticism, not the, not the Gnosticism of limitation, you know, like the, the Gnosticism defined only by the rules of the things that are keeping you away from it. I don't know if that if what I'm saying makes sense there, but uh, um, uh, but yeah. So I'm just kind of I'm I'm letting it, the the listeners know too why uh, why I'm so excited about this this sort of connection. Um, what was the other thing? Um, I've got another so, thing to go into the conversation if you if you don't mind. Just oh sure, yeah. So because there's some bits of historical trivia I just wanted to mention. 
Like, I'll do, uh, yeah, please. Historical trivia time. Like, because um, <laughs> when we were talking about Gnosticism and Stoicism and the connection between them, not a lot of people know this, but the Gnostics, uh, sorry, the Stoics are actually in the, New, in the New Testament, right? Like, and the, apart from the fact that in the Gospel of John, he talks about the Logos, like, and so many people think that looks like it's a reference to the Stoics or to uh, Heraclitus, who the Stoics mm -hmm. were often associated very closely with. But also, like, literally in the Acts of the Apostles, um, St. Paul goes to the Areopagus in Athens and delivers a sermon uh, to an audience of Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. We're told the Stoics actually are mentioned in the New Testament. And not only that, but Paul, what Paul says to them. So if you want to know what the relationship between Stoicism and Christianity is, Paul talks to them. And he you can look at what he actually says to them. So he quotes two pieces of poetry. And uh, they're both kind of pantheistic sounding, like at least the passages that he's quoting. One of them is from Aratus, who is, uh, some people believe, was a Stoic. He was a friend of Zeno, the, the founder of Stoicism. Um, and he, he looks like he's talking to them about pantheistic ideas or pantheistic sounding ideas. Mm. Like, so that raises this question about when we've got this kind of what is the direct relationship between Stoicism and the Christian tradition? And then, you know, I guess one of the topics that brings it into Christian mysticism and Gnosticism would be Stoic pantheism. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And that, like, well, and I think too, there's the sense of the, um, the historical uh, uh, context that, like, for Paul, Stoicism isn't a isn't an ancient thing that that nobody knows about. <laughs> it's it's yeah. a thing that's part of that culture. I can tell you. Well, I tell you what the passages say. It's just um, very short. So he says uh, he quotes one line from Aratus, but it's from um, a verse that begins, "Let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken." So, so first of all, it's a poem about Zeus. For every street, every marketplace is full of Zeus. So it's about his eminence, if you like. Even mm. the sea and the harbour are full of this deity. This is a, for early on, this is quite a metaphysical conception of Zeus. Everywhere, mm. everyone is indebted to Zeus, for we are all indeed his offspring. So it's also portraying Zeus as the father of mankind, which is not necessarily how we think of him. Um, when we're reading Homer and Hesiod and stuff, but the Stoics very mm. much see him as this kind of father deity and also the patron of philoxenia or hospitality, which links in, I suppose, to another Stoic Christian axis, which is the idea of cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism in Stoic philosophy, this idea of a brotherhood of mankind, that everyone is a child of Zeus. Um, and then this was kind of novel idea, or one that was particularly associated with the Stoics. They had this doctrine called oikiosis as well, which means um, bringing people into your household or showing them hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we have this idea of very explicit in Marcus Aurelius, but you know it seems to be implicit in all Stoicism, which many people have said is a forerunner of early Christian ethics as well. Um. Uh, there's also something that even just lines up for me of like even uh, Gnostic descriptions of um, sort of the the monad as the as a as sort of a prime mover, but also like that there's a there's a uh, the the divine spark being something that's been then passed into everybody, which like that that notion of like Zeus is in the harbor, Zeus is among us. Mm -hmm. We're all you know we've all got we've all got a little our little Zeus bit, <laughs> you know. Sure, um, we've all got but again that sounds quite Eastern, you know. Um, where what's where the, I, th I think it's worth saying like the, what this is obviously contrary to. So who are they disagreeing with is a good question to ask yourself. <laughs> like I mean I think there's there's a controversy here that begins with Socrates or maybe even earlier, but certainly very explicit in Socrates, whereby Greek aristocrats believed that they were intrinsically superior. So. Like, you know, the, the Homeric uh, Greek heroes thought of Greeks as being superior to barbarians and aristocrats mm -hmm. as, as being superior to everyone else. You know, but by the time you get to Socrates, he's really questioning that Socrates does philosophy with prostitutes. Um, he does, one of his students, Fido, is uh, 
uh, a young guy that has been sex trafficked, we would say today. He mm -hmm. was uh, captured as a slave and sold to a brothel um, and became a student of Socrates after he was he was freed. Uh, most controversially, Socrates does philosophy with women, which would have been kind of, although some of the Pythagoreans seem to have had female followers, but generally the idea of doing philosophy with, with, with women would have been very controversial. Um, doing it, he did philosophy with the rich, the poor, with foreigners, with Athenians. I think that's one of the reasons he was executed, actually. He kind of really rocked the boat in that regard. So Socrates is kind of applied cosmopolitanism, the fact that he thought philosophy belonged in the marketplace and that virtue was accessible to everybody. And virtue, in fact, could be taught. Um, was you a know, idea at the time. The this actually gives me a, uh, to sort of jump in there, but it gives me a sense like a lot of Gnosticism and a lot of like, I would say modern Gnostics now love to lean into the the rebelliousness. Like we're heretics, we're, we're rebels, we're, you know, like um, we're punks, you know, this kind of like punk attitude of, uh, of, of religion. Um, but uh, would then some of what you're describing, and like we talked a bit about this before the, before the recording started too, of like Socrates as, um, questioning a lot of these things like the assumptions of the people around him at the time would like could we could we give socrates the gnostic rebel you know like badge of honor as well <laughs> yeah well like we go think of where we started off in this conversation socrates is in the naishamadi bible like you know, <laughs> look at, like and so what, what did they get rid of like you know what did the council of nicaea throw in the bin like they got rid of the references to socrates like from these Gnostic codices, we can't we can't have that. Like <laughs> so that got that got trashed. Like and actually, all the kind of more Neoplatonic stuff and the Hermeticism got taken out. Like mm -hmm. of Christianity. So for sure, like I mean, if you want to be a you know a Gnostic Christian rebel, you would bring back Socrates into the mix and. <laughs> What did Socrates say that was so upsetting to people in authority? You know, like, first and foremost, he said that you have to uh, learn to think for yourself. You've got to do philosophy. The unexamined life is not worth living. You have to use reason, you know, not just believe stuff because it's written in a book, but, you know, like, you have to question it and decide whether you or not you actually agree with it. And that was intolerable to figures in authority, as it always has been throughout the ages, because they, they don't want you thinking for yourself. Like, they didn't, mm -hmm. they didn't um, the, the other thing that really upset them about the Gnostics was the idea that you guys, you know, the early Gnostics would um, have dreams and visions that they interpreted for themselves and they could commune directly with God. You know, but what's the point in having a priesthood then and paying them lots of money and stuff? Like, <laughs> you know, you have to have somebody to act as an intermediary so that they can fleece you. Like, <laughs> or, like you know, and, and make a few bucks along the way and, you know, support a you know, their political regime and so on, not simplifying history somewhat here, but there's always going to be that tendency for people to want to make religion doctrinaire, to introduce a hierarchy in order to fleece, like, the population. <laughs> and the Gnostics were a threat to that. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's why they had to go, like, I think. You know, and um, even... Even what you're saying there about the the um, uh, like the Socratic method and the that the, the sort of approach of of continual debate and discussion around uh, around something versus uh, just a received wisdom also makes me think like um, I've heard uh, a lot of people discuss like when you look at the Nag, Nag Hammadi Codex there's there's like conflicting um, cosmogonies in there and yeah. like not necessarily like it's not one cohesive thing. Um, on on uh, uh, online, there's a lot of people who will come into Reddit groups and Facebook and things like that and say, um, "What do Gnostics believe about X?" Like, I'm getting into Gnosticism. What's their opinion on X? And I, I'm, my usual response is, "Ask three Gnostics, get five answers." Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and so I think there's something I'm also just thinking there too of like the the uh, appreciating that ability to to um, engage and question versus receive, I think is uh, yeah. such a valuable process. See, um, I, hate, I hate to break it to you, but you're going to have to think for yourself. I know people <laughs> keep doing that. Like, but sorry, sorry. Like, you know, you like they, they had different views and they were mm -hmm. cool about it. 
Like, and the Stoics, you know, people try to turn Stoicism into this doctrinaire theology, like I was saying earlier, like Christian, Ev Christian evangelicals or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's kind of happened to some extent. But the ancient Stoics weren't like that. They weren't doctrinaire in that way. You know, they had different theological views and they were tolerant of them, like, because they were philosophers. So they questioned things and... You know, like part of that is that you're willing to consider opposing arguments. Like you're not just completely closed off to it. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're, you know, I, I think you're right. If you're a Gnostic, you've got to be somewhat open-minded or eclectic in your outlook because your scriptures, as it were, are, are somewhat diverse in their in their theology. Um, we're, uh, I know we've, uh, we're running short on time here. So it's, a uh, now it's the debate of which question I choose to ask you. Um, but, uh, one, uh, one thing, so without getting too deep into it, cause I know we don't have a lot of time, but, um, modern stoicism, I would say tends to lean more into the cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and, uh, and doesn't engage as much with yeah. uh, any kind of spirituality or cosmogony. Is there any bit of ancient Stoic spirituality or cosmogony that you would like to integrate into modern Stoicism or just see brought into that discourse more often? Yeah, I'd like examining the entrails of uh, sacrificial animals. I think we should be into this. Like, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Right? Of course. <laughs> it's interesting. Like, we, so I, first of all, I'm going to disagree with you. So, so okay. softly disagree, politely disagree with you. Of course. In the sense that I think there's more theology in it depends what books you mean, right? Like mm -hmm. in my I'm I'm biased, obviously. I'm gonna talk talking about my books. Like there's more so some people say you don't mention theology, and I'm like, I thought I did. Like and I go back and look at my book. I think there's quite a lot about like stoic theology in these books. There's a lot about CBT. And I'm, I'm sure like there's there's quite a lot about stoic theology there's like mythology there's also the kind of uh, the metaphysics as well as so it's in there but it's just mm -hmm. not, like i think that it's because it's socratic it's you know like this is a, a, an allegory or it's a way of looking at things you know it's not presented as a, a kind of doctrinaire theology so i think even the books that talk about stoicism and cbt they do i think have more theology in them or f ancient physics, as it's called, in them than people maybe make out sometimes or assume. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely not completely. I think it's there to some extent in, in all the books that I've written on Stoicism. I don't know, maybe, but there are, then there are these authors, right, to be fair, who write, um, there are people that, that, some people talk about broicism and, you know, the there are versions of, Stoic self-help that probably don't say very much. Um, but they're also the ones that say very little about CBT in my experience. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'd say that. What theology could we bring in more? The pantheism, because like in CBT, it's well known that negative emotions like anger and depression, anxiety, tend to involve selective thinking. So you have a bunch of cognitive biases that go with the pathy or the passions, as the Stoics realized. And one of them is narrowing of the scope of attention and also information processing becomes more selective. Um, we sometimes call it threat monitoring when someone's anxious and they only see mm. more than they're anxious about and they ignore potential signs of safety like mm. other people would see. Why is this person so scared? Because they're only seeing possible cues of danger and they're ignoring neglecting like filtering out other things that would give them a sense of safety that other people see when they have a more rounded view of the the situation more rational view so the stoics thought we should expand our perspective um and brought i think the the stoics are in favor of expanding our perspective chronologically spatially you know in a number of ways but ultimately in this cosmological vision of the whole of space and time which it obviously theologically is like entering the mind of god like mm. so for them zeus is omniscient um and can, in his mind there's a, a permanent now in which he experiences the whole of space and time and i, I think they're trying to put themselves empathize with zeus weirdly 
put them, you know, to, to walk to Moons and Zeus's moccasins to Mexico. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, and as far as we, you know, our rubbish um, apparatus can allow us to do that, like we can at least try and expand towards that bigger vision. That's what they call the view from above. Mm -hmm. I think it has a, an obvious place in stoic self-help and relevance to cognitive behavioral therapy for sure. Um, uh, this also again connects to that. One of the things that I've often appreciated about stoicism is that it's a, it, it's a, it's a system of approach that fails gracefully, if that makes sense. Like that even when I fail in my stoic approach, uh, that's like, accept that, that sort of brought within it. It's like, yeah, that's natural. It's natural for you to fail. That's why we're here. That's why we're processing. That's why we're asking these questions. Cause, because you can't let sort of live in that perfect, uh, stoic approach all the time. There's a kind of humility to stoicism as well. Mm -hmm. Um, in the most philosophical sets are named after the founders. Um, at least to some extent, they, they, maybe they have other names like, mm -hmm. So we have Platonism, we mm -hmm. have Aristotelianism, we have Epicureanism, we have Pythagoreanism, like they're named after, and to varying degrees, they kind of put the founder on a pedestal. The Pythagorean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, Pythagoras is probably like a divine being, like, they, you know, he's virtually a demigod. Um, mm -hmm. Stoicism isn't called Xenonism, like it was apparently called that very briefly, but then they quickly changed their minds and decided to name it after the place where they met. And I think that has to do with this current that runs through Stoicism, which was associated with the Stoics, um, of refusing to believe that their founder was perfectly enlightened. And I think that mm. also comes, obviously, from the influence of Socrates on them. If Socrates denied that he was had godlike uh, or perfect wisdom. And the Zeno, I imagine, did that as well. Um, so there's this kind of humility about... Uh, stoicism and an acknowledgement of our own fallibility and it goes hand in hand with this kind of therapeutic emphasis on the fallibility of other people so the stoics again i mean often i think their psychological advice seems like common sense in a way like the stoics said well when people freak out as they sometimes do to use the technical diagnostic term right so when people freak out they often say oh my god i can't believe that someone would behave that way when they get upset with other people, like they act as if it's shocking or surprising that someone would tell them a lie or that someone <laughs> would be hypocritical or unfaithful. I can't believe that guy lied to me or I can't believe that guy said one thing and did another. What kind of person would do that? And that, that's what you say when you're freaking out, right? But if you're an outsider looking at that, like, and you're a bit longer than the tooth, you probably think, this doesn't surprise me, like people do that every day. Like mm -hmm. people lie every day and, and act hypocritically. And the Stoics are like that guy looking at it from the outside, kind of thinking, C'est la vie, like the world's full of liars and hypocrites. Like we knew that already. Like, <laughs> you, surprised, you know, when somebody lies to you or like, they act hypocritically, because all think... humans are fallible. So they, it's the emphasis on accepting their own fallibility and imperfection. And the f fallibility and imperfection of other people, I think, has a psychological benefit because it prevents them from reacting with shock or surprise when mm. other people um, do bad things. And um, a quick follow-up question. I, it, it's not necessarily also the, the uh, when I say cynical, I mean more a modern impression than the, than the cynics, but it's not an assumption that everyone will fail you. It's just a an acknowledgement that they no might. one is perfect. Yeah, that they might. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I wanted to say earlier when we were talking about, you know, dogmatism and religion and stuff, like, I think actually a lot of Gnostics would be interested in what the cynics said about theology. You know, the, almost this, this is where the capital C cynics are, mm -hmm. are often also quite lowercase c cynical. About, <laughs> so Diogenes, a cynic, reputedly saw uh, a young lad being marched off by the guards in one of the temples because he tried to steal, steal a silver plate or something like that from a, a temple. Um, so um, ancient temples were full, were like treasure houses and they, they had guards and fortifications in the ancient world. So some kid tried to steal a silver plate or something like that, Diogenes. Mm -hmm. so, 
and he repeatedly said, oh, look, um, the big thieves are dragging off the little thief. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just really funny. Afar from yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a, um, when you uh, said Gnostic um, Rebels, I thought Gnostic Rebels would love stuff like that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, uh, I mean, I think maybe now we, we need to do a whole series on uh, the Gnostic Rebels you've never heard of. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, we're, I guess we're right around the hour here. I, there's still more questions I can ask you. So, I mean, maybe we'll just have to find time for another chat, but uh, um, uh, in the interest of wrapping up, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'll do some of our like business, like talk about our Patreon and stuff. Um, and I want to ask you about the, anything you want to promote, but is there, is there anything that's like currently still sort of on the field that you'd love to get out about Gnosticism and Stoicism or any relationship there before we kind of do that wrap up? Not really. I mean, the only thing I'd like to say is I think the roots of, if you look, if you care about the roots of Gnosticism, you're going to look at earlier traditions and there are many like in the East and in the West, but definitely the Eleusinian mysteries you know, it's got to be a major precursor you want to look into. And the cult of Apollo at Delphi, like, is going to be an interesting one to look at as well. And the whole tradition of natural philosophy, Pythagoreanism, like the philosophical tradition clearly feeds into that. And it, it was partly the, the kind of early, you know, Catholic Church and the Council of Nicaea that erased that fluidity and that connection with the Western philosophical tradition and the western mystery religion tradition from mm. from early you know from early christianity so you know if gnosticism represents anything i think it's about broadening your perspective and, and reconnecting like with these uh with these other important precursors in terms of stuff that i'm doing at the moment like projects the other thing that i'd like to mention is that we have a non-profit um startup that's been around for about a year that we founded in Greece. Um, I spent a lot of time in Greece and at the original location of Plato's Academy in Academia Platanos in Athens, there's a big park with full of ruins. The Greek government are going to build a new museum there. Um, we said we wanted to build a conference center like so people could come and do philosophy and discuss Plato and Stoicism and stuff. And so we started up a nonprofit that runs virtual conferences and runs also some increasingly physical, increasingly runs physical uh, <laughs> events, not increasingly physical events, like. <laughs> but uh, we run some in-person events in Athens, but mainly also we're, we're building up an audience by running virtual events about ancient philosophy you know, ancient wisdom, if you like, ancient literature and its relevance for modern day living. So our website is just platosacademy.org, and if people are interested, they can check that out. Oh, amazing. And uh, you've also, I think, released some books recently, like a graphic novel? I've got it here. Right. <laughs> yeah. I just do have, I happen to just have it on my desk, actually. So I wrote a graphic <laughs> novel about Marcus Aurelius, and it's got the stuff about the Ellicinian Mysteries in it, and uh, oh. Apollo in it, so like, it's you know, stuff that's kind of more mystical as well. Um, there's definitely a load of theology in it. They have a theological debate in a graveyard at one point. Like, so there's, there's for sure not only CBT in that book. And um, I've for, got uh, of Marcus that's coming out next spring as well. Uh, we we have this as a podcast as well as a, uh, a video thing. Can you also say the name of your graphic novel? It's Verissimus, The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. Is what it's called by Donald Robertson and Zé Nuno Fraga. They're our illustrator based in Portugal. Hence the amazing, difficult to pronounce name. It's hard. <laughs> I'll, uh... Everything is hard to pronounce if you've got a Scottish accent, by the way. <laughs> or at least more interesting to pronounce. Yeah. That's more. It's a lot of fun to listen to. I'll say that. Um, great. Uh, okay. Well, I yeah, I'll, I'll do some wrapping up here too. Um, so again, this is uh, uh, you're you're listening to Talk Gnosis, and um, if you're enjoying this and you want to hear and see more of this kind of content uh, exploring Gnosticism and things that are connected to and interesting to Gnostics, you can support us at uh, patreon.com slash Gnostic. Um, you can drop us cash directly at paypal.me slash Gnostic. Um, and uh, you can find us on, uh, if you Google Talk Gnosis, we think we're the first thing that pops up. There's like a support us uh, button there if you want to do um, Patreon levels and all that kind of thing. 
um yeah i think that's that's where i'll end it there um so yeah donald this has been absolutely wonderful thank you for being on the show um yeah i think we're, we're gonna need to ask you more questions and, and have you on again um so yeah with that i'll i'll draw it to a close and we'll uh, we'll talk to you again soon thank you very much it's been a pleasure Bye.